Thank you, Iris. Thank you, praise team. A night divine indeed. Well, we're closing up our series on the book of Acts um, with the message I've entitled today, Where You Need to Be. And before we open up God's word once more today, I invite you to pray with me and pray for me as we invite the Spirit into his house. Heavenly Father, it was a night divine. Yes, and we're here to celebrate that night, which rings throughout history, Father. And for that baby that was born, for that Savior that was crucified, we claim him now in this place, in our hearts. Let Jesus speak to us and lift us up to where he is with you in heaven right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Where you need to be. Turn with me, if you will. If you've got your Bibles, you've got your phones, you've got your tablets, we are in the final book of Acts. Acts chapter 28. We have been going in this journey through this book all through this quarter, from Acts chapter 1 now to the final chapter, the final stages of the Acts of the Apostles. And we're coming to Luke's, final conclusion as Paul finally arrives at Rome. Now, if you haven't been with us in this journey, just to set the stage a little bit, Paul, who has traveled all throughout the Roman Empire, the greatest empire the world had ever known, having traveled from place to place, town to town, country to country, planting churches, raising up congregations, spreading the good news of the gospel, until at last he makes it to his home in Jerusalem, only to find himself arrested in his own temple, with his own people sentencing him or attempting to sentence him to death. Paul now, as a Roman citizen, claiming his right for a trial before Caesar, the emperor Nero, starts his journey towards Rome. Only throughout this entire journey, he becomes shipwrecked. 276 passengers tossed at sea, yet somehow saved by the grace of God. And that brings us now finally to chapter 28. And we're going we're gonna to skip, the, for the sake of time, the first few verses there. But Paul and those 276 passengers come ashore to the island of Malta in the Mediterranean Sea. Not a single soul is lost. And while there, we're talking about where you need to be. While there, Paul has an opportunity to witness to those inhabitants of this island. He had no intention of going to Malta. Folks, he had what? No intention of traveling to Malta. And yet, God directed him there in the most uncomfortable way possible through a shipwreck. And yet, while on that island, he performs miracles and wonders, healing the sick so that all villagers and cities come to meet him. That's right. And for three months, they were on that island waiting for that winter to pass while Paul preached the good news of the gospel, healing all those who came to him, yes. sharing the love of Jesus. Because right. it turned out Paul was indeed where he needed to be. 
And that's the crux of today's message. In fact, that's the crux of this entire book of Acts. When you follow God, you may not end up where you plan to be or where you plan to be. But when you follow him, when you trust in him, you will always be where you need to be. Even if it's through the shipwrecks of life. Finally, after those three months have passed, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 28 and verse 11. And Luke writes here, it was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods at the figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse. And Syracuse is on the island of Sicily, just off the coast of Italy, the country of Rome. Mm -hmm. And they stayed there at Syracuse for three days. And from there we sailed across to Regium, which was on the southern tip of Italy. So they finally now made it to Italy after this long journey. So they made it across to Regium. And a day later, a south wind began blowing... And so the following day, we sailed up the coast of Italy to the harbor city of Padioli. Now, this was a beautiful harbor city, history tells us, where many ships across the Mediterranean came. And it must have finally felt like there was light on the horizon. Closer now than ever before to their final destination of Rome. And there we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so, and so, after all of the beatings and the stonings and the whippings and the court cases and the false accusations, after the shipwrecks, after the stranding on an island, after all this long Tragic, troubled, distressing journey. And so we finally came to Rome, the capital city of the world. Verse 15. And the brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming. And they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. That's about 45 miles away from Rome. And others joined us at the Three Taverns, just about 30 miles away from Rome. You know, anybody travel overseas, you know, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years ago? Like, we used to travel to India. And, and you know, traveling back in the day was not as easy as it was now. I mean, even when we had, still, we were flying on planes. It wasn't like we were taking these long sea voyages out to India. But, you know, the cost of travel was incredibly high. And what we made was still incredibly low. So there were times when you would fly to a place like India or Africa or where have you, you know it may be the only time you get to go there 10, 20, 30 years. And when you would come to a city, you would find that people 30, 40, 50 miles away would travel under hardship and duress. Again, because it wasn't like jumping to a car on a 50-mile highway like we have today. And they would all travel to meet you at your port of destination. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This is how it used to be back in the day. You know, now things are so much easier. They expect you to come and travel up to them. Like, hey, man, I'm like 50 miles away. You know, take an Uber, whatever. But Paul has made it finally after this long journey. And he's on. He's finally stepped foot in Italy. He's 50 miles from the city. And people are already starting to come out to meet him. And how dearly Paul would have needed that. Because in verse 14, it says, or or, or at the end of verse 13, it says, Other joined us at the way of the three taverns. And when Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. 
You know, that is no throwaway verse there. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. Because Paul must have been discouraged before he met them. And I would only stand to reason. Because I imagine, put yourself in Paul's shoes. I put myself in Paul's shoes. And Paul, this bold preacher, speaker, must have had, as he envisioned in his mind, one day finally stepping foot on the streets of Rome to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To see those who he has witnessed and preached to all across these lands in Corinth and Ephesus and Galatia and all these different places. Coming to meet him perhaps in this place to celebrate what he has done and to help and encourage and to strengthen what he is going to do finally at the capital city of the world. How his heart must have been on fire just imagining that moment. But he does not step into the gates of that city as a conqueror and proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Instead, Mm -hmm. here he is, an old, enfeebled, Mm -hmm. sickly man, shackled in manacles, chained to a guard Mm -hmm. and walking in the streets next to hardened criminals. Mm -hmm. People jeering, mocking him as he walked through. Imagine the disappointment that must have been in his heart. How could I possibly have made it here like this and what possible hope could there be for me to be a witness for Jesus in such a circumstance as this it's only reasonable for him to feel that way Mm -hmm. I imagine any of us would have felt the same have you ever in your life you may not have it may not have been your vision or, or, or your goal to to, to, to stand as, as, a, as a, a, a pulpit preacher like Paul mm-hmm. in the public square, but something in your mind, that goal, that vision that you had for the future, and when you finally reach that point, it's anything but you expected. Right. You are anything that you expected to be. Mm-hmm. And the trials and journey of life have humbled you, broken you, as the children's story said, Mm -hmm. and laid you low. This is Paul, finally making it to Rome. You know, I I can relate somewhat, not in his struggles and his pain, but just, you know, I, I... Everyone knows here I have a special love for this city of College Park. I grew up minutes away. Mm -hmm. I went to school here. I worked at the university for 10 years. I know these streets. I know these places. And when the call and opportunity came to come back to College Park, in my mind, that vision of walking through here with angels by your side and the power of the Spirit just compelling people to come out of the streets and to accept the gospel message, to ride through this place as a conqueror for Jesus Christ. And I imagine what if instead I came as Paul did into Rome? What if that is still the future that is laid before me? Praise the Lord. Lord, help me know. But God, with him, we are always where we need to be. And so Paul comes into the city. But when he sees 
brothers and sisters, those who've received his letters, those who have heard him and from city, from this city, that country, and all these places who are now residing in Rome, they come and they inspire him. They hug him, they hold him, they uplift his spirits. It says he was encouraged. That's right. And verbally, outwardly, thanked God. Mm. Folks, I'm here to tell you, yes, as brothers and sisters in Christ, show your love to one another. That's right. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. And it's not just for the pastor, folks. You know, I am a new pastor and I am just learning because, you know, listen, not everybody is going to agree with everything that I believe with or teach or how I lead. Just as I do not agree with everything other pastors may do or say in all these things. But one thing I am learning as I have met more pastors than I've ever met before Pastors, elders, deacons, ministry leaders, and volunteers sacrifice more than you could possibly imagine for the sake of the gospel. Even when you disagree with their methodology or how they do this or when they do that and all the little things that we can so often get caught up in. Well, I can't believe they're doing that ministry that way. Well, I just I can't believe that church is doing. It. Let me tell you something more often than not. Those leaders are sacrificing more than you can imagine to do the best they possibly can to uplift. Jesus Christ. That's, that's, thank you. And because of that, they are being attacked by the devil. You may not see the shackles on their wrists. That's right. You may not see the burden of a guard by their side mm -hmm. every step of their walk of life. Mm -hmm. But as surely as Paul, they are under attack too. Yes, they are. And the last thing they need is to be attacked by their own brethren. Mercy. Come on. Tell the truth. And so let us be like these believers. Right. And let us encourage and uplift and inspire one another. You don't have to wait to see someone when they're down. Give them a good word even when you see they're smiling. Because they may be smiling through the pain trying to uplift somebody else they may be seeing. Let us be like those brothers, traveling 50 miles away, 30 miles away, by foot probably, to give a word of encouragement in due season. Because I promise you, there are Pauls in this audience today. There are Pauls everywhere you go. If they are sharing the good news of Jesus, they are a Paul waiting for your words of encouragement. Because maybe God placed you next to them because that's where you need to be. Amen. Verse 16, so when we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own pri private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Now, the chapter goes on to talk about what happens. Paul finally gets situated in, in this, this home and he calls out to the leaders of all the churches there in the area to state his case, why he has come. And he assumes that, that perhaps word has come from Jerusalem, accusations about him that, you know, why he should be put to death for his belief. And so he invites all the leaders of the churches and anyone who is willing to hear to come to meet with him as his house, so he could state the case of his belief that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Yes. And so as they all come into that place, listen to what they say. It says this, verse 21, they replied to Paul, we have had no letters from Judea, or reports against you from anyone who has come here. Now verse 22, and listen to this carefully. But we want to hear what you believe. Mm. For the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. Mm. 
Now, folks, I want to take that message from 2,000 years ago in Rome, and I want to place it right here in College Park today. 2020. Mm-hmm. That, this is the public speaking out there now, all right? I want you to imagine now in the streets, in the homes of this city, College Park, to those who do not know Jesus Christ, what is their thinking? Let me tell you, let me share you, because it's no different than 2,000 years ago. We have had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here, but we want to hear what you believe. Folks, people are open to hear just about anything. Because today, people believe just about everything. If they'll believe just about everything, then they're willing to believe in anything. In other words, they are open. Do not assume that they are closed to the gospel. The truth is, they don't know the gospel yet to even be close to it. But we want to hear what you believe. For the only thing we know about this movement, listen carefully, is that it is denounced everywhere. And that holds true today. Christianity is denounced now in the Western world more than it has ever been before. TV, radio, print, in the offices, in the neighborhoods, in the streets. Never before has Western society moved away from Christianity and its worldview. Now we want to hear what you have to say because the only thing we've heard is that this message that you preach is denounced everywhere. Paul was walking into the same setting that we have today. There are people who are willing to listen, to give an ear, to share the truth. But they come with a bias because everything around them has told them to denounce this message. We are Paul. We are in College Park, Paul is in Rome, but we are where we need to be. Verse 23, And so a time was set, and on that day a large number of people, take heart folks, a large number of people, came to Paul's lodging, And he explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Verse 24, now some were persuaded by the things he said. Praise God, amen? Some were persuaded. A large number of people came, and some were persuaded. Take heart, church family. But others did not believe. Folks, take heart even in that fact that others did not believe. Because if Paul, in all his power, in all his indwelling of the Spirit could only persuade through the Spirit some to believe, then let us take heart for those who do not accept the message we share. All right. That's right. That's right. Because we can stand proudly alongside Paul Praise and the power of the Spirit. Yes. Because we were where we needed to be to share what we needed to share, and those who needed to accept it at that moment did. Because, you know, I take comfort in that. Because as someone who's been preaching and teaching for, I don't know, a whole long time now, far before this church got started, 10, 20 years, been preaching in the prisons, giving Bible studies and everything else, I have a tendency to focus on those who did not accept the message. 
You know, you, you praise God for the five or ten who came to accept and, and, and took that stand and went into that watery grave of baptism and came up as a disciple and are now ministering and serving and reaching others. But my heart never forgets those who you have spent your heart and your love and your life to persuade in every which way you possibly could in prayerful, tearful prayers mm. who rejected Mercy. the message. Help. But I take comfort, folks, mm -hmm. that we stand with Paul. It is not our call to convict them. It is simply our call to share and persuade through the power of the Spirit. It, Folks, we've been studying the book of Acts, studying the early church, how to implement that life in the life of living water. And so I share this, folks, because as we reach out into this community in 2020, mm -hmm. Lord willing, we will have a large number come to hear the truth. Amen. And we will persuade mm -hmm. through the scriptures, mm -hmm. through the law, through the gospel, through our testimony, yes. through our personal witness, and some will believe. And there will be others mm -hmm. who will walk away. That's right. And let us not be discouraged. Thank you, Lord. For the Lord will not give up on them. That's right. And through our prayers, neither will we. Amen. But take heart, mm -hmm. because in verse 30, it says the last verses of the book of Acts. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome. For the next two years... Mm -hmm. Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the book ends on no higher note possible, and it says no one tried to stop him. Amen. That no one tried to stop him. Yeah. The devil had already tried to stone him, and he couldn't stop him. He had whipped him and he couldn't stop him. He had left him for dead and he couldn't stop him. He had imprisoned him and he couldn't stop him. He had shipwrecked him and he couldn't stop him. He had a viper bite onto his hand, latched on to drip every ounce of venom he possibly could as everyone stood by waiting for him to drop dead and he couldn't stop him. At some point, even the devil had to give up. And no one tried to stop him because Paul had become unstoppable. Because Paul was where he needed to be. Let me tell you, Paul was most effective in his witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. while he was a prisoner in Rome. Mercy. How was that possible? Wow. He had traveled all over the then known world. Uh -huh. He had planted all these churches. He had raised up all these congregations, all these believers, done all these things. How could he possibly have been more effective for the gospel while in prison in Rome? Because historians believe that most of the letters that you read in the New Testament took place while he was a prisoner. And because of his testimony, while imprisoned, where he needed to be, Thousands of years later, millions of readers later, have been convicted and converted into disciples for the kingdom because of the work he did where he needed to be. Now, folks, as we get ready to close today's message, yes, God has placed you where you need to be. All right, all right. 
we're coming to the end of another year. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're not where you expected to be well. when you envisioned this in January. Mm -hmm. Maybe your health is not where it expected to be. Maybe you're struggling physically, ailing with some struggle in your life, and this isn't where you expect it to be. Maybe there's a struggle at your work. Maybe there's, there's, there's trouble at, at the job and you are not where you expect to be. Maybe you lost your job and you are struggling with employment. You're not where you expect it to be. Well. Maybe there are challenges at home. Maybe you started this, this year and, and maybe, maybe you are ready to get married and all the, the dreams of that marriage and that life with the love for eternity has taken a turn that you never could have imagined. That's right. And you're struggling emotionally and relationally. And at the end of this year, you are not where you expected to be. Maybe sitting here in the pews of this church, watching us online, joining this new church of believers at Living Water, this isn't where you expected to be. But I'm here to tell you right now, with your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ, Amen. you are exactly where you need to be. Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't mean you won't have struggles. Yes. It doesn't mean that you won't suffer, that you won't have trials. Yes. Paul went through the worst of it all. But he was where he needed to be. Because it was only there that God could do what He needed to do. So take heart. Yes. Take courage. You may be sitting in here today with shackles on your wrist, beaten and down and bruised and bloodied. But Jesus is here to tell you, you are where you need to be. In this new year, 2020 is going to be a year unlike any other. Because just like Paul, as a prisoner in a place he didn't expect to be, where he didn't expect to be, when he didn't expect, how he didn't expect to be, God is ready to use you to be a witness like you have never been before. You know, I imagine there were folks who probably heard Paul in all those different cities, in all those different churches, and yet they probably still weren't quite convicted to take up the work of discipleship as they would have uh -huh. until they saw Paul and his suffering. Yes, yes. And they realized, Paul's not going to be around here forever. Guess what? The pastor, the leaders, the elders, none of us is going to be here forever. The work is set on each and every one of you. That is your call. And so today, as I appeal to you in your bulletin, I invite you to pull out my next step. Folks, take out this next step and get ready to take that next journey. The next step in that journey with Jesus. And right there on that first box, my next step is to be where I need to be. Yes. Folks, it may be your next step is to simply stand still and accept that God has placed you where you need to be right now. You're not supposed to be there or there or anywhere else. It is right here, right how you are. Yes, even in your struggles, even in those sorrows, even in that strife. Because somebody, somebody is going to see that witness through you in your struggles and give their life to Jesus. My next step is to be where I need to be. Are you willing to make that commitment today? Yes. It's easier said than done, folks. Look at what Paul went through. I struggled with this because I am sin there. Lord, I do not want to go through the streets of Route 1 shackled, beaten, yes. down and dejected. But ultimately, by Friday night in prayer, I said, Lord, 
Let your will be done and not mine. Folks, we need to stand here together and let God put us where he needs to be. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, God needs us to be right here in this city. To be in these streets and to bring these homes for Jesus. Is that your commitment? Take your next step. Take that next step and be where he needs you to be today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for taking us on the journey of the book of Acts. We thank you for journeying with that early church. We thank you of seeing the witness of Paul. Father, we take strength now, Lord, in all that those who have gone before us, who have suffered, who have struggled through the strifes of this life. But Father, we will go with them. Father, help us to be where we need to be. Lord, let us stand with you. Place us now, Lord, as we prepare for this new year so you can use us as never before to be beacons of hope, beacons of light, beacons of transformation and salvation as never before. Because we know without question Jesus desires to be in this city and to claim it as his own. So Jesus, let it not be upon anyone else, but upon us who you have called. Qualify us now, empower us, us, Father, and send us out as conquerors, even with the chains on our wrists. Because we will be unstoppable with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Amen.